former CEO of CPS, and you actually left with a $1 billion surplus. It was actually a uh, fund balances. Okay. That was the money on hand. I think it was about a $330 million surplus. Oh, good. But in all the funds combined, we had a $1 billion in um, in total fund balances, which was pretty uh, that, We don't know what that means, the word, that <laughs> S word you're using, that surplus word. We just don't know what it means. We also had a hundred and almost 150,000 more students in traditional public schools. And then when you include the charters, we actually had 100,000 more kids. Our enrollment actually grew for six consecutive years after 15 years of decline. And so we went from 404,000 to 440,000. And as a CEO of CPS, you saw firsthand how violence had affected students. And I don't know if people know this, and I don't know if you'll like me sharing this with mm. people, but you went to every single one of those funerals. Yeah, we, we actually created a, a crisis fund, and we paid for well over 120 funerals. Jeanette Push, who used to be director of Operation, I mean, uh, Jeanette Wilson, uh-huh. uh, who used to be director of Operation Push, she basically managed the crisis fund. And, yeah, I went to each of the funerals, not to speak at them. My approach was to sit in the back because you didn't want to, and to say nothing but just to observe because you didn't want to be the center of attention, but right. you didn't want to become desensitized to the constant violence in the community. And let me tell you, during those six years, not a single student that I had in the district that I recall was shot by a police officer. These were individuals who were shot in their own communities, and we paid for the funerals because nothing more traumatic. Obviously, a child dying and then not being able to afford the the, funeral. The funeral, yeah, was really tragic. Well, uh, a man who knows a lot about crime is John Lott. He's uh, president of the Crime Prevention Research Center, former senior advisor for research and statistics at the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Legal Policy, and author of Gun Control Myths and More Guns, Less Crime. We welcome him back to the program. Good morning, Mr. Lott. How are you? Doing great. Great to talk to you guys again. Yeah, so we recently wrote an article in Real Clear Investigation titled America, the Outlier, Voter ID, excuse me, Voter Photo IDs are the Rule in Europe and Elsewhere. Tell us about that article. Right. Well, I mean, uh, obviously, there's a lot of debate about uh, some states uh, adopting different types of uh, voter regulations here. Um, The interesting thing is that even with the rules that are being adopted, these states don't have as strict uh, voter regulations as we see in Europe. Uh, 46 of the 47 countries in Europe uh, require photo voter IDs for people to go and vote. Um, oh, three quarters of the countries in Europe ban absentee ballots in their countries uh, for people living in their countries. And uh, about another 20% of the countries uh, either require that you have to have a photo voter ID uh, to go and pick up the ballot beforehand, or they limit it to uh people who are in the military or in a hospital at the time and require third-party verification that you're going to be unable to uh, uh, vote uh, at that time otherwise. So, I mean, it's not just Europe. Uh, You look around the world, uh, developed countries around the world have very similar types of rules, whether it's Canada or or Mexico with regard to things like uh, IDs that are required for people to be able to go and vote. And the thing is, uh, these countries haven't always been this way. Uh, They've developed these rules over time, and parties on both sides. Uh, You know, for example, in Northern Ireland, uh, uh, the first ID rules that they had was uh, under Margaret Thatcher, conservative government in 1985, um, but Tony Blair, uh, Prime Minister for, for Labor in 2002, uh, argued that it was some of the IDs that were allowed, like your uh, medical card, uh, were easily forged. So in 2002, uh, he limited it to only tamper-proof uh, photo voter IDs that could be used. Wow. Um, well, can you so, explain, just explain how showing an ID be, became racist? And part of voter suppression. Well, if it's if it's voter suppression and racist, then all of Europe is that way. I mean, the one 
country that doesn't have it completely right now is the UK. Uh, but even they have legislation that they put forward so that within a few months, yeah. uh, every single country in Europe will have um, photo voter ID mandated for you to be able to go and vote. Um, you know, and that's not just there. I mean, you look at Mexico. Mexico uh, in 1991 adopted very strict voter regulations. They completely banned absentee ballots, even for people living outside of the country. Um, and uh, they set up a, a biometric card that you had to have that had not only your picture, but had your fingerprint. People would check fingerprints uh, to allow people to be able to vote. Um, and, and the interesting thing is when these countries have adopted these rules, you're asking about voter suppression, the voter turnout rate increased. In Mexico, for example, uh, you think, well, they banned absentee ballots. Uh, they made it very difficult and costly to get these cards. I mean, you had to go twice in person. Nothing went through the mail. Um, you had to go once in order to apply for the card. You had to go back a second time in order to go and pick it up. Many of these things required people to travel in some of these states as much as 100 miles to be able to get it. And yet, when uh, if you look at the three presidential elections after they adopted these rules, the voter turnout rate was up by nine percentage points over what it was beforehand. And you see this in other places in that when people became more confident that there wasn't fraud that was yeah. occurring, they were more willing to go and vote. You know, it, I don't, it's not so much a question, but an observation. You know, I, I've always felt that that the the whole voter ID thing was it was too much to do about nothing. You know, it's pretty insulting to to just assume that, you know, poor that, people are not going to have their IDs. Or, or they're, they're not going to know where the DMV is. Or the DMV or how to, use to a get computer. their ID. I mean, it's just the silliest thing. And But the narrative is, you know, if you voter ID is tantamount to Jim Crow. I mean, when they make reference to Jim Crow, and Biden probably is old enough to remember Jim Crow, uh, the, uh, you know, and... When you equate that, uh, some of the things that the states are trying to do to, uh, you know, to uh, ensure that there's proper voter identification and to fight voter fraud, when you equate what they're doing to Jim Crow, it's just it's just part of this. It's part of this negative. It, it, it's part of this narrative. You know, the problem in our country, though, is a voter. Uh, you know, the voting laws have 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 never really been standardized nationally. And we've always left it to the 50 states to fend for themselves. You know, the federal government, the courts have been reluctant to get involved in these issues. Uh, you know, so so. Yeah, you know, but then you had the lockdowns and Democratic states just decided, oh, this is a perfect time right. to rewrite our election laws to have mail in ballots. We don't have voting day. We have voting months. But the problem, the problem is there's day. always been a reluctance on the part of the federal government to intervene and tell the states what to do. I mean, even McConnell's comments, you know, about when he was actually criticizing, you know, Trump's criticism of certain states, basically saying the states have always had great autonomy. I'm not defending what he said. The reality is the states have always been given broad autonomy over the voting. But I'll tell you what's worse. Well, this last year. Yeah. Go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Year, the issue this last year, the issue was uh, it, it wasn't the normal legislators deciding the issues in the different states you'd have. Uh, courts uh, changing the rules. Uh, you'd have uh, just the Secretary of State mm -hmm. uh, making an agreement with different plaintiffs on their own. Um, you know, the big debate about Texas right now, Biden just on Sunday really tore into Texas and the horrible things that they're supposedly doing there. If you read the bill that they uh, walked out on, uh, the big thing that they're doing is they're not allowing 24-hour voting. Uh, you'd have these ballot boxes that would be around uh, Harris County, which is where Houston is. And um, uh, the law says that you can only allow the ballot boxes out between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Uh, and, and that somebody has to be with the ballot box to observe it. Uh, they was concerned that you have a box that's out at 3 a.m. in the morning and nobody's observing it. You have no idea if somebody could possibly tamper with the box during that period of time. Uh, so it was 
essentially just getting rid of some of the rules that were changed only for the election last year. But there's no country in Europe, there's no country, developed country that I know of that allows ballot boxes to be unattended uh, for people to go and vote. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, but yet somehow uh, allowing an unattended uh, ballot box now is viewed as necessary because uh, otherwise you have, uh, as Amy was saying, you have Jim yeah. Crow. Uh, you know, I was just going to say nothing, nothing that is done in the red states to bring about greater voter accountability. They can't do anything without it being used to feed this narrative that somehow they're trying to deny poor people the right to vote. I mean, that's going to be the narrative. And what's going to happen is the mainstream media just picks up on this in lockstep without actually looking at what they're requiring, the, how reasonable those things are. Yeah, and right now it's, there's more restrictions in the state of Delaware yeah. than in Georgia. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but they're not even bothering to that's compare. That's right, but that's because it's a, it's a blue state as opposed to the red state, so that's what's going to happen, and, and it's going to continue to happen. I, you know, I've said over and over again a, a greater risk is not, voter, is not voter suppression but voter negation, and by voter negation I mean drawing legislative maps that guarantee one party, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, literally no opposition. I mean, well, that's this, what we have here in Illinois. Right, now. exactly. I mean, despite the scandals in Illinois, despite the scandals involving Speaker Madigan and the investigations and things like that, I mean, what did they lose? Three seats? And this new map is, they've got, what, 17 Republican uh, uh, state reps are going to, in effect, they're all being placed in, they're all going to be running they're against each other. They're going to lose running against each other. In they're literally going to be running against each four other. Four Republican lawmakers running against each other. So so they're going to continue to have, have or almost have a veto-proof House and Senate. So even if you had a Republican governor, uh, I, and, you know, you, certainly you can criticize Ron or whatever, you could his approach or his, you know, I mean, some of his. Uh, but but the bottom line here is he never had a chance with the with the v, literally veto proof majorities in both houses to get anything through, to have any progress. All right. John Lott. Great to have you on the show. Everyone should read the article. The column is America, the outlier voter photo IDs are the rule in Europe and elsewhere. Thank you so much, Mr. Lott, and have a great day. Thanks. People can find more at our website at crimeresearch.org. Thanks very much. Thank you. Crimeresearch.org. And he joined us on our turnkey pro answer line. If you're talking about it, Dan and Amy are talking about it. It's Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560, The Answer. You've counted points. You've eaten nothing but protein. You've drank nothing but shakes, and none of it has worked. But one call to 855-5NJ-DIET can change all of that. With NJ Diet, you can lose a contractually guaranteed 20 to 40 plus pounds in only 40 days. NJ Diet starts with bioenergetically personalized supplements based on your hair, saliva, and blood work. Then NJ Diet uses DNA testing to create your ideal diet plan and workout regimen to help you keep it off. NJ Diet is a hormone detoxification system that evaluates and targets each individual person's needs 